Uh, I'm really excited to, to be here this evening and, and join a, a really cool group of presentations. I love hanging out with really smart people. Uh, uh, hoping it rubs off a little bit also. So um, I'm Eric uh, Buhai. I'm also going by Eric, Wal Eric Walsh Buhai. I was married last year and I'm one of the weird people who are gonna change my name and ask me in another year how that works with citations and all that good stuff, but um, I'll probably write a book about it. Um, uh, but I'm really excited to, to be here and talk about uh, Human Dynamics in the Mobile Age, which is the area of excellence that I was hired under, and a specific application of digital technologies and sexual health, which is my um, really real interest area. So uh, I like to come to places like this with objectives so you know what you'll get out of it. Uh, and if you don't like this, then you can go now, I guess. Um, but by the end of this, you should be able to define human dynamics. Uh, you'll be able to describe uh, an example, at least one example, of human, human dynamics research applied to digital technologies and sexual health, and identify some areas for future discovery in this area. So this is really who I am. Um, my background is, is really all about sexual health promotion, and mostly among young people, teens, middle schoolers, high schoolers. Uh, and, and really how we can promote sexual health uh, in these young people, uh, as well as applying innovative technologies, really understanding the influence of technology on human behavior, but also how we can employ it for health promotion and behavior change. And it's, it's this latter area that, that brought me to San Diego State in 2014. Uh, it's the Human Dynamics in the Mobile Age uh, group, which is led by uh, Ming Sao in geography. And you might be asking, uh, what is human dynamics? Well, human, human dynamics we define as a transdisciplinary research field focusing on the understanding of dynamic patterns, relationships, narratives, changes, and transitions of human activities, behaviors, and communications. And, and many of the, the terms included in this definition are really represented by the faculty which are listed below. I'm the, the bearded one on the left. The bearded one on the right is Joe Gibbons in sociology. Uh, Lourdes Martinez, who's in the School of Communication. Ming in the middle, who's uh, the lead. And Atsushi Nara, who's in, in uh, geography also. Uh, and my expertise that I bring to the table is public health, and I'm a trained social and behavioral scientist. So. Um, as I mentioned, my, my real interest is in human sexuality, and right now I'm teaching a course of human sexuality to 85 undergrads, which is interesting. We could talk about ethical issues in human sexuality, um, and we talk about reproduction and sort of issues of, of childbearing and things like that, which is autism. So there are certainly some, some relationships in this group. Um, but for the last several years, uh, my team uh, and I have been studying sort of the influence or, or the reactions of society to new technologies. And, and I like to call this, I relate this to moral panics. Um, there's, there's always been a moral panic as associated with advances in technology. We can look back to inventions of the light bulb, for example, and people were uh, afraid that light bulbs would illuminate rooms to the dark outside so that bad people could see sort of vulnerable women and children inside alone. And it's no different now with today's technologies, and especially social networking websites like Facebook, but also sexual networking uh, platforms and websites. We think of things like Match.com and eHarmony, which are dating websites, but we also think about places like Tinder and Grindr, which are geosocial networking applications, so applications that we use on our phone that find people who are near us who might have some interest areas that we're interested in, specifically sex. Um, although Tinder ar argues people who use Tinder, depending on where it is, also find other things like dates. So I wanna show you um, a brief video uh, that I already pulled up here and demonstrates the, the most recent moral panic here. Talk about a perfect storm brewing with the use of hookup apps and skyrocketing STD rates. Apps like Tinder, Down, and Grinder are driving Utah residents into their neighbors' beds. Heidi Hatch has been investigating a link between rising STDs, which are sexually transmitted diseases, and these popular apps. Heidi. Shana, this is a problem that is literally starting at our front doors. Just over the last few years, for women alone in Utah, Gonorrhea rates are up more than 700% if you can believe it. 
The state is scrambling to figure out why. But as I started my own investigation, I saw an anecdotal link between a lot of those dating and hookup apps and these STDs. And before you say this is not happening in my neighborhood, you'll want to watch this story. Well, we're not going to watch the story because I just like to show the beginning of that. She did her own anecdotal research. Um, and I am extremely proud of her for doing that and also scaring the crap out of people in Utah for um, sort of the dangers that Tinder and these apps present. Now the real question is, are these apps dangerous? And this question is not a new question. It goes all the way back to the light bulb, but also to Facebook and these other places. This is a recent uh, billboard in Los Angeles, actually uh, put up by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, that also kind of stigmatize these, these um, websites that are decent and allow people um, great opportunities to meet other people. But it really all started with these types of websites in 2000. Jeff Klausner, who's a physician out of San Francisco, started noticing uh, a group of men who have sex with men, mostly were gay identified men, uh, who came in with uh, syphilis. And uh, he found that these men were meeting other men in a chat room. It was called um, Men for Men, and it was on, uh, if you remember, AOL uh, America Online. And so it sort of kicked off there, this sort of moral panic around the internet and meeting partners online. Since then, there have been sites that have popped up around every niche or desire. There's Christian dating, there's herpes dating, herpes and STD dating, there's farmers only dating, there's, for every niche there is a type. And so it's uh, not just for men who have sex with men, but everybody and, and for every need. I actually saw something about feline lovers recently. Uh, and you may have even seen on Craigslist, this is Craigslist San Diego, there's casual encounters where you can find hundreds if not thousands of people looking for sex now. Now um, this is not all about instant sex or instant gratification. We all might know somebody who's met somebody including their boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, wife, husband, etc. online like on eHarmony or etc. And the Pew Research Center is reporting that acceptance and use of uh, mobile apps and dating site is actually increasing. So it's a good thing. Um, but we still hear a lot about some of those dangers. Uh, this is an early research study done by Paige Paget out of UT Houston School of Public Health. She found that 30% um, of women who met partners online the first time they met that partner had sex with that partner the first time and 77% of those did not use a condom at first sex. So while that also is sort of alarming, there's, there's some, some larger questions that we ask. Well, there's some meta-analytic studies that have mostly been done on men who have sex with men and have shown higher risks for unprotected anal intercourse, um, both receptive and insertive. But what about heterosexually identified individuals? mostly people who I study. So our team in Florida studied um, young people and found that about 12% reported ever meeting a partner for the very first time through a digital mechanism, online, Facebook, those sorts of things. Well, what about risk? We actually found that people who met partners only online, which would be the sort of that risk area that we're thinking about, wasn't the risk area. It were people who are meeting partners in both online and offline venues. So it's almost like a new opportunity. We've also been asking uh, questions of teens, so even younger people, and you might be like, oh my God, he's talking to teens. Yes, 13 to 19 year olds about meeting people online because it's happening. So another study in Florida that we had actually used biological STD specimens chlamydia and gonorrhea to see if there's really a biological STD risk. And we've found no biological risk for STDs for meeting partners online. There's a slightly higher behavioral risk for this type of activity, but it doesn't translate to biological risk. What else are we finding? Well, we're kind of flipping the equation from the negative unintended pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, and starting to look at some good things, some positive things. In our teen study, we actually found that young people who met partners online versus people who met partners offline had equal amounts, reported equal amounts of sexual satisfaction. But the online folks actually reported lower 
relationship satisfaction, which often makes sense. Um, because of the nature of online relationships, they tend to transition a lot faster than offline relationships, and we're still doing some more research. So one of the things I'm bringing to the table here are some questions. Obviously, more questions get answered than uh, a lot of the, um, the, the really important critical questions. So what's needed? Well, there's now a lot of research on heterosexually identified young people, and it's time to do some really real compilations of that research. Is this a risk? Is the Utah newswoman right? Or are we you know, just sort of having another moral panic? especially around geosocial networking apps. And I've got some students here now at San Diego State actually working on this research. Are apps like Tinder and Grindr and Bumble um, uh, sort of working up to be the scary things that people make them out to be? We also want to start seeing some qualitative research, some, some more important research to understand this process. Okay, it might be a risk, it might not be. It might have positive outcomes also, but how does this play out? How are people meeting people online? What are their experiences? Um, you know, how does this work from off online to offline meeting? And then I think most importantly for our work is really how to employ digital interventions um, in this area of research. There are plenty of areas ripe for study in this and that are fundable. I want to first of all thank my partners from the CDC and some, from some various other uh, agencies as well as some funders and of course people who have participated in our research. Um, that's me and please feel free to shoot me a note if you have any questions or want to talk some more. Thank you so much. Questions for Eric? Eric, could you comment about the effectiveness of let's say billboards or even online advertisements <laughs> that should reduce the potential risk, condoms, um, drug therapies, so on, as preventatives, and how effective they are in terms of actually changing the behavior of these participants. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so the first part, billboards. I mean, billboards are terrible. Um, I, I think they're great marketing tools, uh, you know, obviously they're linking mechanisms, so if people want to get STD testing, it's memorable, you're on the road, you know, either on public transportation or on the highway, you see it, you think, oh, okay, I need to go get a test, oh, there's a place I can go do it. But if it's, if it's about condom use, you know, it's not, it's, the timing is off. Right? It, we need something that's more proximal. People are driving, they're not thinking about sex, they're not, re you know, they're not ready to have it. Uh, maybe, if anything, it does is it's a cue to action to go by the store to buy condoms or to stop by the clinic to pick up some. Um, I don't love billboards personally, but I think that they are some nice linking mechanisms for the clinics. Um, digital ads, um, many of the, uh, the geosocial networking apps like Tinder, um, many of the sex networking apps like Grindr now do have very many, um, a lot of uh, uh, health promotion testing ads. Uh, although I just had a student today practicing of her thesis and one of the questions she was doing is asking students uh, who use Tinder if they've ever seen the, ad, the ads and if they've ever clicked through. And a very small number of those students who use Tinder uh, actually click through. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still uh, some areas for research and, and to figure out how we can be more creative and, and get people to click through to what we have to offer. Yeah, so this is from an older woman. Um, so are there differences Age between... Age doesn't matter, it's okay. I know. Are there differences between people who use these kind of apps in terms of uh, risk behavior than people who don't use them? Yeah, and I, I kind of uh, cycled through that slide pretty quickly. One of the things that was in there is... Um, is some of our descriptive statistics on who uses them and whether there are differences between people who are meeting partners online and not meeting partners online. Um, uh, uh, we, there are some in terms of risk characteristics. As I mentioned, it's not a biological STD risk environment, but people who do use some of those apps are 
uh, more sexually experienced. For example, they often have more vaginal sex partners. Um, they have an earlier age at first intercourse, whether that's oral, anal, or vaginal sex. Um, so the risk profiles tend to be greater, but it doesn't necessarily translate into biological uh, STDs or HIV. Um, and we know some other, among young people, we know some other characteristics like um, uh, age and, and, uh, and gender and, and uh, identification. One, one feature you haven't mentioned is uh, sex trafficking with these types of apps. Is there an uh, increased danger for um, young people or international people to be trapped when, into so when, a sex trafficking situation? Okay, so are you asking about if young people use these apps, go to meet somebody, they find, and then they're uh, uh, sort of taken or? Um, either that or that the people putting ads in these apps are using them as a vehicle to promote their sex trafficking yeah, business? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I think there's been some high profile um, events that have put that out there, whether it's trafficking or sexual assault or like murder. I think we've seen a couple instances, one I know in Connecticut not too long ago where somebody met somebody through either, an, I think it was an online uh, dating site, met them and w was murdered and, and sort of those kinds of things hit the news and it makes everybody kind of take a step back a little bit. But I don't think we've seen systematic evidence uh, from young people at least reporting those kinds of dangers. Um, in Florida, we, I had another doctoral student working on um, some more of the qualitative, some more of the experiences of people who report meeting partners online and through geosocial networking apps. And the, the risks, she was an anthropologist and all of her, um, she is an anthropologist, and all of her is about the sort of the conceptualization of risk. And that kind of thing really never popped up in sort of the daily lives of these digital natives. We call young people now digital natives because they grew up with the technology, unlike me and, and probably most other people in the room. Their idea of risk is different. It's very much like, um, have you ever seen the show Catfish on MTV? Do you know what catfishing is? I see people somewhat nodding. But it's where you're meeting somebody online, you're, you're talking with that person, you're messaging and talking with that person online, and then you go to meet that person and it's not the person who, who they made out to see, so they, they call it been catfished. Um, that's the risk that is really uh, prevalent in young people's minds. Um, it's not worries of trafficking. While that might be a possibility, I don't think that's really materialized the way I think um, we've seen it in news and other things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, thank you very much.